Okay, so boom. Okay, so boom. Okay, so boom. Okay, so boom. All right, man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. Today, I got a new guest, man, somebody that jumped on the scene and has been doing his thing. You don't know, you about to find out. Today, we got Mr. Joe Baker on here. So what we're going to do is, Joe, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let them know who you are and where you're from. Okay, so boom, y'all already know what it is. Your boy, Joe T, man. I'm from Springfield, Tennessee, man. I've been rocking on YouTube for a couple of months now. And I, I got to pay homage first and foremost. I know you told me to introduce myself, but listen to me. Jay gave me a shout out. I sent a lot of traffic, man. Jay, a real one. I want to let you know I appreciate you, but love. But yeah, man, Joe Baker, man, from Springfield, Tennessee, man. And listen, we're just living life and telling my life at the same time. You grew up in Springfield, Tennessee. Let us know about that, man. Who was little Joe? What was life like? Oh, no, no. See, my daddy, my daddy got locked up, you know what I'm saying? When I was like two, three months old, you know what I'm saying? He got two life sentences uh, for a murder case, a double murder, double uh, a double robbery case, you know what I'm saying? So I grew up without my pops, you know what I'm saying? As far as my mama, my mama dated one of the biggest dope boys in the city. So as you can see, like my hand was already dealt a certain type of way, you know what I'm saying? As soon as I came out of the womb, I was kind of already introduced to the streets before I even knew, you know what I'm saying, what the streets was. So yeah, and then and then on top of that, and a lot of people probably can relate to this, like the environment that I was in, it was already crazy and chaotic. So jumping out the porch at a young age where I'm at, you really, you have to move a certain type of way. Like you have to learn how to survive at an early age because everything rough around the edge. And then on top of that, you ain't got no guidance around, you know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's dead. It, and then on top, ain't nothing to do but get in trouble. That's it. Right. So you, you was one of the kids that ran the streets, you got in the drug dealing, what was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, it started off with me. I didn't get into selling drugs till later on down the line. I started, I started off about, you know what I'm saying, just doing little simple petty stuff like breaking their houses and, and stealing cars, you know what I'm saying, with my homeboys, you know what I'm saying? And that was our type of fun, you know what I'm saying? I didn't get into the dope game until later on in life. I might have been about 16, and that was when my brother, my brother had started, you know what I'm saying, selling dope. My brother was one of the biggest dope boys, you know what I'm saying, in our little area. I really only wanted to sell dope because of him. You know what I'm saying? He had the cars, he got the girls, he got this, you know what I'm saying? He got that. But he never introduced it to me. But I knew I knew what he was doing. And my brother got plugged in to the streets from my daddy, from the penitentiary. You know, it's crazy. My daddy was the folks, you know what I'm saying? So he had connection to the folks outside. So he plugged my brother in. My brother had a major plug, but he ain't never break bread. So finally one day I'm on the phone with my daddy. And I tell I said, Man, listen, man, bro, I ain't breaking bread, do it this, this, and that, and get what my daddy did plug me in with a, a whole different plug so that's how i ended up you know what i'm saying selling dope that's how that happened yep so did you what you all right so clearly you went away to prison which is was that your first trip did you get locked up prior to that oh no yeah yeah well that was my first trip my first trip the first trip and last trip let me put that out there uh but uh now nah, i was in and out of juvie from the age 15 all the way up you know what i'm saying the first time i got sent out to juvie like i said uh we broke in somebody's house we stole fifteen hundred dollars we took the fifteen hundred dollars of uh, the person who took us on this little lick slash burglary. He got caught because the people knew him. He ended up telling on us. So I did five months and five days that time. I got out. You know what I'm saying? When I went in that time, that's when I really got uh, fascinated with you know what I'm saying the gang life or whatever. My, I we used to go see my daddy when I was little, and he got a pitchfork burnt in his hand. So I didn't really know what it was, but I knew the language he used to speak when I was a kid. So the first time I got locked up, I started hearing people talking about gangsters and gangster disciples and this, this, and that. And I was like, oh, oh, that's what my dad is. So that's when I got intrigued and I started, you know what I'm saying, trying to dibble and dabble in, in the gang life, not really knowing what it's about. And then I got out, stayed out a couple of months, went right back in for stealing cars. This time I kind of, I graduated a little bit. I went from a group home to what they call a YDC, which is like a baby penitentiary. It moved like a penitentiary, like literally they got the dorms. It moved like a unit. It moved just like the penitentiary. I got out and then I stayed out a couple of months. I went right back for attempted murder. I ended up shooting a guy three times with an AK-47. Uh, went on a high speed chase, ended up jumping out of the car, passed out, my body shut down. I was low on potassium. Police picked me up, took me to the hospital. And we was on the high speed, we got the guns and all this and that. And then I got locked up that time. I did a year, that was in 2005. Got out November 16, 2006. I wasn't out a couple of months, uh, 2007, special aggravated robbery, special aggravated kidnapping, first degree premeditated, three counts of felony murder, and then eventually after I got to the jail, you know what I'm saying, I got desperate and, 
ended up escaping and caught the escape charge. That's how I, that's how I ended up with the tent. How old was you with it when all this happened? I was just, I, I think I had just, I was either 18, about to be 19, or I had just turned 19. So you were an adult. Let's go, let's let's back up a little bit because a whole lot just happened real quick. You escaped. <laughs> yeah. You escaped because every inmate's dream is to go home and get up <laughs> out there. Yo, yeah. let, let's run that down if you can. If you can talk about it, talk about it. I got a couple escape jackets. I got a couple escapes on my jacket. This one was juvie, you know what I'm saying? The first time I got locked up, what I told you for the five months and five days, the dude that I was with, we go to court. He tell on us, Jay, this man, we, we finna get escorted. He jump out the van and take out running. So the second the second time I got locked up, you know what I'm saying, where they was transporting me, where they took me to, it was a little place, a little, little hick town, you know what I'm saying, that my caseworker tell me that these folks was racist. I'm like, why is you even taking me here? So when we got there, it was an old man that worked, you know what I'm saying, they worked a little place at night, you know what I'm saying? So I done called my homeboys and told them, you know what I'm saying, to drive up here and knock on the door because he was ordering food every night. They bringing pizza at, at, late at night. I'm telling them, just come to the door, knock on it, you know what I'm saying, and say y'all the pizza man if he unlock the door just run in you know what i'm saying do whatever y'all gotta do take the key boom, boom, boom. let us out we're gonna run i'm these folks was on the phone listening to me trying to orchestrate this plan so the next day they come in we watching tv through the pie flap you don't know what the pie flap is they let me know you ain't never been to juvenile if you ain't never yeah. been to juvenile, I advise you never go so <laughs> we watch the tv through the pie flap they turn the tv off wow when they turn the TV out, we all looking at each other. I'm looking at them, they looking at me, we all looking at each other. We like, what, what's going on? They then pop the door, open it up, tell me to come out. Make a long story short, these folks done choke me out, punch me, you know what I'm saying? They rough me up a little bit. They trying to get me to tell on myself. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know what y'all talking about. So I tell my caseworker, and they had to hurry up and come and get me because of what happened. But when they transported me back, they didn't put the child lock on. They being nice. They buying me food. I'm sitting in the car like I don't know the door. Like they were like, you need to use the bathroom. I'm like, yeah. They were like, well, right, come on. So I opened the door. They walking in front of me. I'm like, these folks is tripping. So by the time they started walking, I just stopped. They turned around and looked at me. I'm looking at them. We looking. At them. I shot out running. That was the first time I escaped. The second time was on the attempted murder case. That was the first time I made the news. Uh, when I shot the dude, they transported me to what they call they, it's a detention center called Rutherford County in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, when we got there, I started playing crazy. That's the first choice Johnny story on my case. I'm playing crazy. <laughs> they telling these folks, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm hearing voices and seeing stuff. So they they transport me to a place called Middle Tennessee Mental Health. They take me there to get evaluated. And while I'm there, my caseworker, he ain't convinced he know me he been my caseworker all my life he come up here and get me get these folks to discharge me and somebody had a key so he give me the key to the cuffs i put the key under my tongue and as they transport me back i take the key i take the shackles off my leg and put it on one leg so by the time they let me out the van boom i strike out running so when i strike by that that's the first time i made the news so who gave who actually gave you the key it was a it was another it was a person who was at the uh i guess you could call it the, the psych ward in middle tennessee it was another i don't know how he got the key it was to me to listen to me they can say what they want to say it seemed like a divine moment like i was supposed to get that key but i met this dude early we outside chilling he pulled out a handcuff key and i was like where did you get that he was like man i'm using this i'm running when they come and get me this isn't that and they came and got me early and i begged him i was like man bro let me get that key he was like nah i said i'm gonna come back and get you i listen i told him, man i'll come back and drive a car whatever Dude, you gotta say man whatever i need that bro they coming to get me now i'm gonna drive a car through the day room for you he gave he gave it to me man and uh i ran across him later on and he said man you ain't come back and get me bro <laughs> I <couldn't. laughs> but yeah that was my that was my second escape and then the third escape, check this out. Uh, the third one, my third is uh, on that on that murder case, man. Uh, and I escaped out of this one. I still got the newspaper clipping. Like I got another one too. Like I get, I need to laminate that thing. I got another one. But on this one, uh, man, I was scared, Jay. I'm, I ain't even gonna. Be, I'm gonna be honest with you. Like I've been in and out of trouble my whole life. You know what I'm saying? I ain't never ran into no murder case. You know what I'm saying my homeboy, we done did everything together. We started off, you know, young stuff. Just, just, you know, we done ran trains together. We done stole candy together. I mean, you name it, we done did it. We started selling dope together. You know what I'm saying? We done had shootouts. You know what I'm saying? Little stuff done shot people. You know what I'm saying? I shot three, four people by the time I was 15 years old. They ain't never, when it comes to stuff like that, 
even when we hit the lick, we hit a lick one time for $125,000. Like I'm not, it's not a fear of they gonna tell. The police called me before they called anybody. They called me first because my name was always hot in Springfield anyway. So I know the police department number when my phone rang. And I answered, he was like, man, come down here. We need to talk to you. I'm like, about what? He was like, I think you know. I said, I ain't got nothing to say. I get out the phone. As soon as I get out the phone, they call my little cousin who's sitting next to me, tell him to come down there. Then my mama called me. My mama talking about, <laughs> talking about you need to go down and hang up on her. By the time I dropped my little cousin off, my mama done drove out there with her to take him to the police department. I'm telling him, don't take him. She said, if y'all didn't do nothing, why y'all worried about it? He stayed back there three and a half hours. We all know what time it is. This man come to my house, Jay, after getting interrogated for three and a half hours. He walked free. He was the driver. He supplied the guns, the guns in his name. This man walked, get out of there, come to the house. Cause I, I ain't gonna lie to you, I was gonna pop him. We across the street and he was like, cuz, he was like, I told him, he was like, I did tell you, like, but I didn't tell him nothing about you. And I'm, I kind of believed it at the time because I'm like, how in the world did you just walk free? From, because it was a it was a kidnapping. It was most definitely would have been a robbery. And this man got shot and he bled out and died. And my cousin is basically just told him he was on the scene and he free. So a part of me was like, maybe he didn't mention my name. So a part of me believed maybe he didn't say I was involved. Come to find out, he did. So, and then once they came and arrested me, I found out, you know what I'm saying, other people made statements and whatever else happened. And so I'm sitting in jail. And at this point, man, I'm, I'm terrified. Jay. This is life. My daughter is four or five years old at the time. My girlfriend was beautiful. You know what I'm saying? I was in the streets. I had a little money. You know, and just like that, you know what I'm saying? When they come to that, when they made that call and then ran in my house, freedom, freedom is, it, it snatched quick. I'm sitting in a cell. I go from just riding clean, having nice things, being able to go to the refrigerator, straight into a cell. So my mind is going crazy. Like, I have to get up out of here. And then I don't know what I'm going to do after that. But right now, the plan is to get out of here. So it just so happened, homie. Uh, I get to the jail, come to find out my charge partner, it was four of us. My charge partner, the one pull the trigger he's upstairs this may have been up here telling people about the case they put me in the cell with somebody everybody know about people trying to jump on you if you've been to jail before on something serious i don't care if it's something serious or small you could be in the cell with somebody who trying to get on your case they trying to offer information to the to the da so they can get a deal so soon as i walk in the cell with this man jay i ain't in here three minutes I tell him, he introduces, I was like, what's up, Sailor Doodle? And I tell him my name. I'm like, I'm Boo. He was like, Boo. He was like, man, that sounds familiar. I was like, you ever heard of Boo Baker? Because everybody know me by, you know what I'm saying, Boo Baker. You know, he was like, man. And instantly, he started talking about my case. I said, wait a minute, because, you know, they got the mic in there. I said, hold on, bro. I said, I said how you? I said, man, quit talking. And so he tell me, my char partner down here doing story time at night talking through the door. I said, don't you say nothing else while I'm in this cell. When Rick time over, it's over. I'm refusing to say I'm not coming back in the cell with you because you could easily write to the DA and say, I'm the one who gave you them details. That's over with. So I come out, I go down there and holler at my child partner. I'm talking to this man. This man looked me in my face. I'll never forget it. This was probably the moment I realized I, I need to get out of the street. <laughs> this man looked me in my face and said, Man, with all the stuff you done did, little boo, you supposed to been locked up. I said, dude, what? I said, you know what? Don't even worry about it. I'm finna play crazy. So, so I walk off. <laughs> I walk off the door, Jay, and instantly at the wreck time over. I told him, man, y'all gonna have to come get me. I ain't going in. I buck the police. They take me downstairs. I get to the observation cell. In the observation tank, I can see everything. The door is like seconds away from me to go outside you know what i'm saying well it's four doors two push doors and then the two doors that they got to click for you to go out so after i'm down here for a couple of days uh after i'm down there they ended up I, i'm watching people come in that need to be processed and gotta get booked but sorry she didn't she didn't like me being in the cell so she'll let me out of there now and then get on the phone clean up like i was a little rock man and one day i'm out on the rock and while i'm out there this dude come in 
And she was like, step in the cell real quick. I'm going to process him and get him booked, and I'm going to let you back out. This woman put me in the cell and just closed the door and didn't didn't lock it. So when she did that, my first, my thought was, oh, this is the move. I turned the light off and laid down. It just so happened because I was playing crazy. The med cart came through and the woman opened the door and it was unlocked. She had a fit. She said, who left Baker's door open? I said, my God, this woman just jacked my freedom off. About two weeks later, it probably wasn't even two weeks, it happened the same way. I'm out on the rock. This dude come in. He come in aggressive, though. He talking crazy. And she told me, step in the cell. She did the same thing. I'm going to let you back out. Boom, she shut the door. I turned the light off. I heard the, the men car coming down the hall. I got up. I said, I don't need the meds. I'm good. I don't need them. <laughs> so, I'm good. She said, you sure? I don't need to let her make it around the corner. I said, I'm sure. She turned the men car around, man. I, let, I laid down, Jay. Third shift come in, didn't check the door, didn't know it was unlocked. And you know if you've been in jail or prison, you only supposed to open one door at a time. Right. This is another divine moment to me. So the woman said, you want me to buzz them in? I can hear it. And it echoed through the hall. And then I hear, and I raised up. I said, did she tell buzz both of them doors? I said, oh, she done crashed out. <laughs> Listen, I got up, stood at the door for a little second. You know what I'm saying? The police looked over, waved at me. I waved back at them. While they, soon while they were sitting there, I barely pushed the door. <laughs> door swung open. It was like slow motion. Like everybody just kind of looked over like, and I read the officer lips. He said, before anybody could process what was going on, listen to me. I was out of there. I was out of there. I ended up getting caught because uh, they put the reward out on me where I was at. Dude called the police on me while I was asleep. They surrounded the house and it was over with. So, yeah, that was yeah, that was my third one. That's yeah, so obviously that case didn't turn out too bad. Oh, no. This this was the case that sent me to prison. No, we took. Okay. I, I went in in 2007. Me and my trial partner, we didn't get no time until 2010. Uh, they ain't had no case. Only thing they had was the two people who was also with us. When they arrested me, they took me to the police department. I'm down here two hours. I'm telling lie after lie after lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. They were not buying it. I'm telling them, let me call my lawyer. They called my lawyer on the speakerphone. He tell me, oh, you can go ahead and talk to him. I'll be down there. I'll be down there in a few, you know what I'm saying? We're straight now, whatever, whatever. So I, that's when I started talking. I'm lying and lying and lying and lying. And I ain't saying nothing to incriminate myself. As soon as I told them folks I was in the car and on the scene, that was the statement. Boom. They were like, oh, we rat. They signed it. This lawyer that I hired, was the same lawyer that was the lawyer for the guys when I hit the lick for the hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. It was one of the biggest robberies ever in Robinson County. So it was more of a vendetta. These folks wanted to convict me more for that than the actual murder. They they, they was more upset about that. So come to find out he done backdoed me. Knew them folks was coming to arrest me that day. So all of this stuff come out and he admitted so they dropped the deal down. I think the deal was at twenty two. They dropped the deal down to 15. I told them, give me an eight. Then I think they was like, give me a 12. And then my lawyer was like, let's just split the, split the difference and put give it a 10. And then add the one on for the escape. I was like, was my lawyer was like, you need to take that. That's a, that's a win on this case. Even though I didn't want to take it, you know what I'm saying? I've been fighting the case for about two years, almost three years at the time. I went on and signed for it and hey, I'm glad I did, because had I took them to trial, man, you wouldn't be having this interview. I'd be doing life. So when they convicted you, you already had, what, th about three years in? So you had another eight to do. I had like two years, like two years of eight or nine months in, like right at three years. And then the lawyer gassed me up telling me, you know, you'll be eligible for parole in three years and three months, because it was a 10 year, it was 11 years at 30%. You know what I'm saying? And people, they, they tricked me with their percentage, thinking oh, I'm going to have a chance of making parole. One up for parole, they smacked me for three years right out the back. Serious of offense. They ain't hearing it. How old were you? How old were you uh, when you went away? 19. I went in at 19. Yep. What was prison like for you going in at 19 years old? I'm going to be honest with you, Jay. Prison in Tennessee ain't... Prison alone is not good. But Tennessee is probably real laid back and soft compared to a lot of prisons. 
And I say that because, you know, of course I was spooked going in because this is something I have never experienced. And of course, people don't hear all of these prison stories and watch these prison movies. And majority of the time, prison ain't nothing like that. It ain't even really designed going down like that. Some, some, some are, but the truth of the matter is, if you do it, if, if you want to get into something in prison, it's because it's what you just, this is how you moving. It was kind of laid back, like, but it was a lot of stuff I couldn't see. That's for sure. When these people going in and out of these cells and things that's going on, beefs that you don't know about, people owing people, why people getting stabbed. Going in, it was just, you know, I coming in just like everybody else came in, got to figure this thing out. I, I did have an advantage going in because I was going to the same prison where my daddy was at, who had been locked up his whole life. You know what I'm saying? That he did run the compound at one point in time when he was GD. You want to know what's crazy to me as I'm listening to you? The first thing that comes to mind is when we started this, you said your dad was doing two life sentences. Yeah. So in going to the prison and getting locked up, that enabled you to spend more time with your dad on a day-to-day -day basis than you ever really had in your life. Yeah. How was it being with your dad, man? Are you and your dad alike? How was it getting to know your dad, man? Was it everything you thought it would be? Was it was it crazy? Was it like we just too much alike? Like yeah. how was being with your dad, man? That's an emotional question. I actually just got goosebumps thinking about it. My mind just kind of went back. It was everything I needed, Jack. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that was the reason I got sent to prison more than anything. You know what I'm saying? I understand my actions and what I want, but I feel like I needed to be around my daddy more than anything. And then eventually my daddy's brother after me and my daddy got separated. But when I got to the prison, we didn't even get to spend a lot of time off the bat because it was me, my brother, and my daddy was at the same prison is what I'm talking about. But when I got there, my daddy, I'm on close security because of the escape charge. My points was extremely high. After I got classified, I went to close. So I had to do six months on close. And after close, I come down to general population. So by the time I come to general population, my daddy was still running the compound at the time. He got caught with some tobacco. They moved him to another prison. After I'm on the compound for maybe two weeks, he got shipped. So I moved my brother in the cell, you know what I'm saying? We got to fight and almost killed my brother in prison. <laughs> yeah. When he went home, I, uh, my daddy got me moved to the other prison where he is at, which is at Northeast. And that's why I was going with the correction officer where I got in, the girl I got engaged to. But uh, that's when I moved in the cell with my daddy. Like, and it was crazy. I'm glad you asked because I got to see how genetics is very strong like i got to watch his mannerisms and certain things he was saying certain things he would do his character and it was just like i was a split image of dude like seriously like i could really understand why my mama used to say you acting just like your dad or your daddy this or not. like i could really understand i'm like man this is crazy and uh i got to also love my daddy to death don't no, love my daddy to death i got to also see a lot of my manipulative and with my manipulation and my a lot of bad things also came from too. It was certain things he tried to do to get over on me when we was busting moves and stuff like that. And I was like, hmm, I would have said the same thing. I would have tried to finesse it there too. <laughs> and by the time I was ready to start working on myself, I was like, I I, I ain't I can't I can't do that right there. I ain't gonna be like that. But it was everything I needed, man. We had a moment one time where because he finessed me to come to this prison where he was at by saying he was going to give me a, a touchscreen phone as soon as I got there. So when I get there, he got two phones. He don't want to give me the phone. He's talking about it don't make sense for both of us to have a phone. You know, we'll just use this one. Something go wrong, we'll just use the other one. So we get into it one time. He called himself taking the phone. And I know where he keep the phone. You know what I'm saying? The dude who hold the phone for us. You know what I'm saying? Uh, God rest his soul. He ended up dying. He ended up getting killed. But I go over to the cell, and it's an old dude. It's an old head of the penitentiary, Jay. Like, he ain't going. So I went in there. I done roughed him up in the cell. Like, man, where that phone at? He said, man, that's between you and your daddy, man. This, man, I done roughed this man up in the cell. He run out of the cell, man, and then he ended up telling my daddy. And this where me and my daddy had a heart-to-heart. -heart. I had never had a heart-to-heart -heart probably my entire life until I was in the cell with my pops, man. And uh, I remember him looking at me, and he was like, man, you don't love me. And I was like, what you mean? He was like, you don't love me. I was like, I do love you. You know what I'm saying? And then he started telling me why he felt that way. And I could tell we was about to have this kind of the conversation probably me and him both needed. And uh, he started to tear up. He turned his back on me. And I walked up and I grabbed his shoulder. When I grabbed his shoulder, he kind of threw his arm at me. And I was like, what's up? Because I, I, I told him I wanted to fight. 
off the top because he didn't want to let me use the phone and this and that. And then he called himself trying to check me about the phone. I told him, man, put your shoes on, man. He was like, dude, what? <laughs> so that's what he started saying. I didn't love him because I told him, I said, man, put your shoes on. Homie. So uh, we ended up having a heart to heart. I told him how I felt like, homie, you missed my whole life. Like my mama had to do everything. Like your side of the family didn't do nothing. You know what I'm saying? They brought us to come to see you. Might've gave us, you know, 10, $15 here and there. But my mama raised us by herself. She was in and out of court with me. And this is, and you try to check me in front of this woman who didn't raise me. You know what I'm saying? And then he spoke his piece and, and then, hey, that's my guy. Like I told you when you when you hit me, like, I was like, I don't follow my pop. Like that's, that's my dude, you know what I'm saying? Like we, that moment made us, you know what I'm saying, tight. So it was crazy, man. It was, that was probably the only thing that was worth the time. The five or six months me and him was in the cell together. That five or six months is probably what changed my hope, my heart and my mindset about how I was gonna come out here and live. Do you think do you think that not having your dad there played a part in you being who you were? Oh, uh, that's a tough one because me and my dad had talk about that. I think at the end of the day, I would have made probably some of the choices I was going to make regardless if he was there or not. Because, you know, you could be in a child life and if they choose to bump their head and jump in the streets, you could do everything right and they can still choose to 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 go down that lane. Like I got homeboys who had their mama and their dad and they still wanted to come to the hood. I would want to say, yeah, it would have been better. But uh it also uh I have to look at it this way too. Depends on what type of man he would have been on the streets. Because the if he was the same type of man that sent him I still would have followed that. Had he been a hard working man and instilling that in me from the beginning and i had those kind of things instilled in me i don't know but if he was the the gangster that he was i would have most definitely would have been in the street so yeah people look at us a lot of times and they see our past they yeah. see our history then you come on from prison and they think that same guy's coming up out of there <laughs> how did you transition from being boo to being joe man first and foremost man i want to say this especially if it's in a young cast i was scared i ain't afraid to say that like I, I knew for a fact, Jay, with the life that I lived on the streets, I was already telling myself, if I go home and try to live that same life and come home and think I can bully the street, they, they would have killed me. You know what I'm saying? Or, or I would have ended up in a way worse predicament. And after doing 10 years and seeing the stuff that I saw in prison, experiencing the stuff that I experienced as far as being affiliated, being in the cell with my dad, being in the cell with my brother, being at the penitentiary with my uncle, at some point, a man got to say, when is enough? Like, when is it enough? Like, I don't, I'm not, I ain't never been the type to look for validation. A lot of these dudes, they flashing guns and flashing money and wearing certain things because they, they want to be seen and heard. I was never that type of dude. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't a, man, I want to come home. I didn't care nothing about her having no spot. I wanted my freedom, man. I wanted to be free. Like, not just from the prison. Like, I wanted to be free of the mindset. Like it ain't about the streets no more. Like it ain't, it didn't, it didn't get me nothing, Jay. All this, and this another thing. Man, I'm glad you asked me that, homie. Y'all listen up. This is very important, this man about to say. I know where he's going with this. Go ahead, Joe. Speak your piece, man. I gave my life to the streets, Jay. Everything, every bit of me. Them folks didn't honor that, man. These mm -hmm. folks will say they don't respect people who telling and this, this, and that, and they still in the streets right now. They mm -hmm. say they're going to take care of their home. They ain't sent me a dime. None of my homeboys mm -hmm. sent me a dime, homie. Didn't do nothing for my child. Didn't see nothing about my child. I realized that the streets, it's a mirage. It's fake. It ain't nothing real about it. And that 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 broke my heart, Jake, because it was like, I contribute everything. They tricked you, man. I've it, been tricked. Man, literally. Like, I could have served life in prison all for nothing like literally i wasn't there 365 days i wasn't there a year them folks had already quit answering the phone for me jake it was simple stuff hey can you do this man i'm gonna get around to it and then i answer the phone when i call back like homie what i done helped your mama pay her bills before i done pulled up when you needed this and i done fronted you work none of that don't mean nothing mm -hmm. N nothing i think where dudes fail is they leave prison and they run back to them same dudes that wasn't there for them they run back to them streets that wasn't there for them, and they bypass the people that actually were. The yeah. mama, the family members, the ones that sent you cards, sent you money, answered the phone, you run right past them. And tell yeah. them dudes, what's up, man? They hugging you, I love you, oh, you back, you back. 
But now you know, you mm -hmm. know that at the end of the day, they don't love you. That love ain't real. When I came home, like I didn't, I went around my homeboys one time and I knew even why I knew it was it. Had nothing changed in 10 years. They was doing the exact same thing, same conversation, messing with the same girl, talking about what they finna do next. Nothing, didn't own nothing, no, this is nothing. It was just like, that ain't it. I didn't do 10 to come home and then sacrifice my freedom and life like this. It's like, there ain't no way I'm finna do that. So it's hard letting that go when that was all you know. Like, that was all I knew. All I knew was selling dope, robbing, you know what I'm saying? Speaking the lingo, you know what I'm saying? So that transition of like, I, I used to ask myself when I used to pray, it was always what that's going to look like. Like, what does my life look like outside of this? And truth of the matter is, it's a scary question because I don't have no experience. I don't can't nobody give me no answers to that. And then, and then it became beautiful because I realized in that moment, I can create that, Jay. That question I'm asking, what do it look like? I get to create that reality. Right. Yeah. So what is life like now? Beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's get into that. So you got children, right? I got one. My daughter, she grown. She 19. She finna be 20. Samaria, man. That's my heart. That's my baby. Yo. I mean, how does it feel now to just be Joe Baker and not Boo Baker, man? I, I'm free, Jay. I'm emotional. I ain't gonna, I appreciate this. I'm a humming. And they hated me more for the change, Jay. Y'all will follow people in the streets to the piss of hell. I don't care. You will crash out, ready to go, ready to hurt people, ready to steal, ready to sell dope, ready to crash the community out. You see me make a complete 180, go the opposite direction, change my life, doing great. And you hate me even more. You want me to come back to the, to the misery. Stuff happened to people who become any level of success from their hometown. I don't even go home, Jay. Mm -mm. I ain't been home in the last year. Right. No, you know, I, I hear a lot of times, man, people say, uh, you changed up on us. <laughs> right. I did change up. Maybe y'all should change up too. <laughs> what? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's not, I didn't do a change up. What do you consider changing up? Not getting locked up, not being out here, being alive, taking care of my business, being a man. If that's what changed up is, then absolutely, I wear that. I changed up. My first year home, it, it bothered me a little bit because, you know what I'm saying, I wanted to bring my home, boys. I wanted to show, I wanted, I'm thinking they'll be interested in, you know what I'm saying, something different. And they got, it's what they call it, survival remorse, you know what I'm saying? And then I realized, they don't, they don't want to go and everybody ain't meant to go. Like, let's just turn it loose. And when I turn it loose, you know what I'm saying? Been by myself, rocking by myself. And in due time, I'm knowing that the most high, he'll put the, the people around me that need to be around me. But I ain't got, it's been five and a half years. I'm, I'm great. I'm in a bigger, I'm in a whole nother city. I get plenty of love. I'm still writing books. I'm still doing stuff as far as my business. I'm free. I'm financially free. I'm split like, I'm like what? Then them folks is running from the police right now. <laughs> I want to know why you ain't hanging out. <laughs> no, I don't even have a phone for him, Jay. <laughs> it's over with. I don't even want to rap. So when I messaged you earlier, man, I said, all right, let's go ahead and run this. You said you were on the phone with your dad. Yeah. Your dad, as we talked, is doing a two life sentences. And one can only use his imagination to know that in talking to your dad, it keeps you fresh with what you left behind. Yeah. And, what, and what's going on. What did your dad have to say? Is your dad one of the men that's like, all right, I love you, boy. Stay out of trouble. Man, what's, what's life like? I know he's a good friend of yours, other than being a dad. I know y'all friends as well, but yeah. how was that, man? Do you ever, you're free now and your dad's still in there. How's that? It's tough, man. You know, that's why I do everything I can to help him. You know what I'm saying? Like, he got a podcast, he got a YouTube. It's called Doing Time with Joe. It's spelled D O I N, Time with Joe. Uh, I try to help him do as much as I can as, as possible. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's my guy, man. I'm going to tell you something like, he he's a constant reminder of, not to take this stuff for granted. And he's so full of life, Jay. Like, you know dudes is locked up and they still, they full of life. Like he mm -hmm. still got it. Like he's still making moves. He's still trying to educate the stuff. He's still trying to find out different stuff that he can do that's within his reach, the resources that he can use to still try to make a difference. You know what I'm saying? So when I hear him talk, it's no excuses for me. 
You know what I'm saying? When he want to do that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it keep me motivated, keep me alive because he's sitting behind that fence with two life sentences. And there's people out here who taking their freedom for granted, complaining about their jobs. And I'm watching my daddy with two life sentences make a way from, <laughs> from behind that fence. So, you know, it's a it's a blessing. To, it's a blessing to have him as a father and as a friend, you know what I'm saying? And and to listen to him and, and just know, you know, hey. You got you got one life, man, and he he's still trying to make some of it, even though he got the time that he got. So he he inspired me. Yeah. How did how does books come into play? Man, when they denied me that the first time they denied me a parole, they hit me for three years. I'm thinking, okay, I know I'm gonna get it. They telling me to take the programs, do you know anger management, take therapeutic community, get your GED. Boom, I knock it out. I go up. They hit me for another two years. I'm thinking, okay, I I deserve it. I go up. D folks, I got like. Maybe like almost right at two years, like 19 months left. That man, I wasn't in there 30 seconds. He said, do the remainder of the balance. I tapped the mic. I, I said, excuse me. I said, what? Can you, can you repeat that? He got closer to the thing. He said, do the remainder of the balance. <laughs> I, said, I said, man, you got to be kidding me. And at this time, I'm at, I'm at the second worst prison in the state. I had got out of being affiliated. You know what I'm saying? I'm moving different. You know what I'm saying? But the books came about because I started asking myself, what was I going to do when I got out? You know, I didn't want to come home. If I had to, I would have. You know what I'm saying? Because all you hear is, you know, come home, get you a job. It's got to be something else I can do, man. So after about my third day in the cell, man, I told myself, I said, man, I'm going to write a book. And he started laughing at me. I said, man, hand me my pen and paper. I wrote my first book in 14 days, man. I wrote it nonstop, the, the life Sunday to Sunday. And it's about a dude who basically trying to figure out how to get out of the life and what does that look like. So after I wrote that one, I wrote a sequel to it. And then after I wrote the sequel, I wrote part three. And this is what let me know when I came home, if you stick to this and use the same energy you use in the streets, when you selling dope, when the strategies you come up to try to rob people, if you use the same energy behind these books, you're going to be just as fine. And I sold my first 44 copies, Jay, in a prison. I, at this point, I was at the worst prison in the state. They call it the Thunderdome, Northeast, Northwest. I sold 44 books. My mama sold them for me at her job. When I called home and she told me I was selling them for $20 a piece, I said if she could sell 44 books at $20 a piece and I'm sitting in the cell, I said I'd get out and sell a million. And man, I came home, I hit the ground running. I ended up writing a book about my life, the life of Boo Baker. And when I wrote this one, man, after I sold my first my first thousand copies, I said, we ain't, we ain't gonna stop. And people in my hometown, they try to tell me, man, you ain't gonna be able to keep selling books. I said, well, uh, you don't see the vision then. You think I just wanna sell to the, to the hometown. I said, I'm trying to sell it to the world. And uh, by the time I sold two thousand books, I said, "Man, we can we can do this." You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm over. I'm probably over ten thousand copies in, in the last uh, two and a half, maybe three years. And man, we still pushing. Like I got I got a thousand books sitting right here, a thousand books in my closet, and you know, what I'm saying? so we, we we push it. And 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 this is and this is actually my substitute for selling dope. I ain't gonna lie. Like this is my this is my crack right here. This is my this is my milk. This is my this is my dog food. This is that thing that. I know, you know what I'm saying? This is, I put this on the scale and I'm gonna sell it. So it's it's my thing for me. So yeah. Let me start off by saying, man, I'm proud of you. Appreciate I that. know what it is to turn your life around. I did it. You know, mm -hmm. I lived that life. I was out there. We, uh, we don't have to be who we've always been. And we're, we're prime examples of that. Yeah. To them little Joes out there, man, the guys that are aspiring to be Boo Baker or be the Boo yeah. Baker in the neighborhood or be that dude that's got that pistol riding around with their homeboys. Yeah. To them watching right now, that's who you used to be. Yeah. What would you say to them? Man, listen to me. The streets ain't it ain't what it's hyped up to be. And I hate to say this, but we all gotta go through our process. You know, sometimes you can hear this, but sometimes it takes some kind of experience, some kind of traumatic experience for you to realize all the seeds that's been sold in you, and then you wake up and say, Man, I heard Jay talk about that on his show. Or, I heard I heard Joe T talking about that or or Bill or whoever that you have been listening to, but for some reason you still choose to go through that. Cause Jay, I, I did have my basketball coaches who said, man, you better than that. You should just keep hooping. 
I didn't want to hear it. I did have, you know what I'm saying? I did have family members, you know what I'm saying? They didn't do as much as I wish they did, but it was times they told me that my friends wasn't my friends and the, the streets ain't this and uh, you can't sell dope forever and you gonna go to jail or you gonna end up like your daddy. Like it was moments. And it took for me to sit in that cell and, and replay all of them times. People said that times and my teacher said, you know, you smart. You just don't, you're not, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. I know you should. And I sit in that cell before I took the time facing life and was like, man, I done jacked my life off, homie. And sometimes you got to go through the process. And I hope y'all from listening or whoever you listen to, it be Jane, me or whatever. I hope you don't have to go through the process that you take the time and say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and get in front of it because you can you can you can cut it off right now you can decide right now that them homeboys that you know you ain't your homeboys the sack that you moving you can decide right now to take that money and start you a business and turn and and, and 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 turn it around i didn't you know what i'm saying i kept going and, and i had to go sit sit behind that fence man and and then having to play catch up but so yeah that's what i would say man uh if you ain't gotta if you ain't gotta <laughs> go through that process if you got the option to choose today man choose life Choose life. Real talk. It's been a pleasure having you on, man. Please let everybody know where they can find you at, what platforms you're on, everything that's linked to Joe Baker, man. Man, my YouTube is Joe Baker. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my YouTube is is what I would rather y'all just go to. You know what I'm saying? My TikTok is J-O-E-T-B-3. My Instagram is B-A-K-E-R-I-I-I. -I -I. And then my Facebook is my name as well, Joe t baker the third them, them all on my platform but uh if you want to get the fullness of me it's youtube joe baker man and uh jay well man i've only did one interview since i've been home man uh it was with this guy named dan and it was when i first came home it was a year you know what i'm saying we did a follow-up but uh i done turned a lot of them down but when you shouted me out on your channel and I seen a lot of people in my comment section, man, said, man, Jay shouted you out. And then when I DM you, you hit me back, you know what I'm saying? And then, then when you gave me your number and messaged me, man, you was like, man, if you need any kind of help, you know what I'm saying? Let me know. And then you told me, you said, man, uh, if you ever just need somebody to talk to, you know what I'm saying? You can hit my line. In, man. It meant a lot, man. Cause, uh, it ain't out here like that. And I knew it came from a genuine place. So, you know what I'm saying? I really got to tell you, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate this interview, man, because uh, you really just made me realize, really, I probably need to turn it up a notch because uh, you made me talk about a lot of stuff I don't think I done talked about in a long time. So, bro, I want to tell you, I appreciate you for real. appreciate you opening up and uh, being willing to talk about those things. And I'm happy to to always be here. For anybody that I deal with or I reach out to, I tell them all, if you need something, you need somebody to talk to, reach out to me. Because at some point, we all need somebody to talk to, man. We do. Got anything else you want to say before we sign up out of here? Anybody you want to shout out? Anybody you want to holler at real quick? Man, just everybody who have been tuned in, man, who been, everybody who been tuned in, who been watching, man, who been following, who been supporting, you know what I'm saying? I just want to say, man, it's, it's much love, and I promise you, it don't go unnoticed, you know what I'm saying? If I can't respond to every comment, listen to me, I, I saw it, it just, I might have been, you know, I just want to let you know, ain't, ain't nothing one unnoticed, man, ain't nothing to support me unnoticed, man, because if it weren't for y'all, I, you know, it's just, that's what it is, you know what I'm saying? So that's really all I want to say, man, it's been a lot of love, I done enjoyed this, man, and y'all be blessed, y'all hold it down. I appreciate you for coming on, Joe. So you already know, man. Anyways, these jails, the tent centers, these prisons, these facilities that are just crazy worlds inside of a already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing, man. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? <laughs> like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute.